The Last Gasp, An Ever After Mystery, written by Shatona Havig, narrated by Krista Del Sorbo. Chapter 14 Sterile. Lucinda hadn't expected the courtroom to be sterile, but it was. The judge's bench, the row of seats, the lack of windows. Of course, if she'd been asked, she wouldn't have been able to describe what she expected. She never expected to see the inside of a courtroom, ever. She sat on the bench beside two others, wearing the new blue dress Mrs. Cohen had brought her, and with her hair brushed and pinned in place. One by one, the judge listened to the charges, asked a few questions, and either set a bail amount, lower than she imagined they'd set for her, or denied bail. That'll be me. Denied. Although Mrs. Cohen and Gary had both insisted she had nothing to worry about, nothing about releasing an accused murderer made sense to her, bail or no bail. What were even thousands of dollars compared to a life? We'll pay the bail, Mrs. Cohen had insisted, despite all of Cinda's objections. Miss Lucinda Ashton? She rose as the others before her had done. Yes, Your Honor? The judge read the complaint against her, and Mr. Darrow rose. To her surprise, although Lucinda didn't know why she should be, the judge acknowledged the man and asked him to state his business. I'd like to request that all charges be dismissed for insufficient evidence. After looking over spectacles at both the lawyer and Lucinda and back at the papers in his hands, he said, Her shoe was found at the scene of the crime. A shoe she was not wearing, sir. She left the building in the presence of two witnesses, who are present in this courtroom today, wearing both shoes. Furthermore, she was in the presence of witnesses for all but just a minute or two at most. Not enough time to get through the back of the building, kill someone, go out the back, lose a shoe, and return wearing both shoes. The judge looked back at his papers. The complaint doesn't mention witnesses. Today isn't about presenting evidence, Mr. Darrow. We're here to... Doors banged from the back, and a few people seated around the room began murmuring. A man strode into the room, his shoes creating sharp echoes with each footfall, and the judge waved him forward. Once he perused a paper the man held out, the judge then peered over his spectacles, looking first at the man, then Mr. Darrow, and over to Lucinda before stating... Case withdrawn. Next, that would be Eddington. What else the man said, Lucinda didn't hear. She found herself enveloped in a hug and led from the courtroom to a loud murmur of voices and the banging of a gavel with demands for order that went unheeded. As the doors shut behind her, reporters clamored for a response, but Mr. Darrow promised to make a statement once, Miss Ashton has been taken away. She is, as you can imagine, under a great deal of shock and strain. Will she give an interview later? That remains to be seen. More questions were fired at them, one after the other. Did she know why the district attorney had withdrawn the case? Did she know who had killed the three victims and shot another? Was she guilty? That one prompted her to gasp. Of course not, before she could stop herself. But Mr. Darrow didn't react. He just led her to the car, opened the door, and ushered the ladies in. Mr. Cohen slipped in on the other side, and when she looked back, she saw Mr. Darrow standing there, speaking with the horde of newspapermen. What will he tell them? I don't even know the answers, except to whether I'm guilty, of course. He'll make a ten-minute statement to the effect of, they had no evidence and they knew it, she shouldn't have been arrested. That'll give us time to get home before any of them hope to get there, which is all he's trying to do. Will Gary be... She bit her lip and shook her head. It's probably best. Mrs. Cohen patted her hand and squeezed it before giving Lucinda a bit of space again. He's gone to Pasadena to buy that house you looked at the other day. Oh, he took Herbie with him. That dragged her back out of the funk she'd slipped into. Herbie? Really? How? The story came out, how Gary had met the boy, taken him with them to the boarding house, 
overheard enough to make Gary suspicious and then had ridden to the Walker place with them. While we were inside, trying to discern if the accusations against Walter were valid, that boy sneaked over to the garage and rummaged through the cars in there looking for anything like evidence. What evidence did he expect to find? Mr. Cohen spoke when his wife choked with, well, some kind of emotion. Lucinda wasn't certain what. He didn't know, but the boy found a gun, handgun. What he described sounds like a mouser, but I'd have to see it to be certain. Only in that word, mauser, did Lucinda hear the faintest trace of a German accent. He'd know, I guess. Wasn't he born there? Her throat dried faster than a dewdrop in Death Valley in July. Mr. Walker's? She choked out. Can't know, Mr. Cohen admitted. It was found under the driver's seat. Was it shoved under from the back? Kept there by the driver? We don't know, but Darrow's putting a word in the DA's ear. Something about it didn't sound right. But... Mauser sounds German. It is. Mr. Cohen stared at her. Why? Well, she swallowed hard. Mr. Walker wasn't in the war, didn't fight for Germany. How would he get a German gun? It happened again, that awful tightness that came when she saw something familiar that reminded her of her parents. The Coens exchanged one of those silent looks that long-married people did when they had something to say that didn't need words. Mrs. Cohen patted her hand again and said, His son fought in the war, though. Came home a local hero, remember? But lots of soldiers brought back souvenirs from France and Germany. Trinkets, small bits of art or pottery. Mr. Cohen broke in there and guns they'd taken from soldiers they'd captured. The car pulled into the Cohen's estate drive, and Lucinda's heart skipped all the way to the waiting Studebaker and the two fellows leaning against it, grinning. Gary! By the time Mrs. Cohen had extracted herself from the back seat and made room for Lucinda to get out, Gary had reached the door as well. In a move that belonged in a movie, she stepped out of the vehicle and into his arms. Cinda! They withdrew the case. Give me a minute, he whispered. I just want to hold you for a minute. Eyes closed, head resting against his shoulder, Lucinda relaxed and allowed herself to revel in a moment she'd begun to doubt could ever happen. As if the previous day hadn't given every impression of an omen of impending doom, California's famous sunshine beamed down on them as Gary lingered just a moment longer. She was safe. The temptation to propose before something else happened to prevent him almost overrode Gary's desire to create something special they'd always remember. The beach, I think. Perhaps the Santa Monica Pier. Something different from the dinner this mess stole from her. Only a few birds singing in the rustling leaves of nearby trees marred the silence. I think a few of our avian friends are celebrating with me. Our, oh, Cinda leaned away from him, scanning the area. Her cheeks turned pink before deepening into a dark rose. I think we've been abandoned. She stepped back and Gary decided, today. A moment later, he added to that thought, now. However, Cinda had already turned to go inside. We shouldn't keep them waiting, not after, Cinda, those honey waves begged to be freed from their pins. Hers were natural waves that, when not working, she didn't arrange into the fashionable Marcel style. He preferred that natural look, but hadn't ever told her. With one step toward her, he reached for a hairpin that just peeked out from behind an ear and plucked it from her head. You don't need this, do you? Gary! He reached back, felt for another, and plucked it from her head. Or this? What on earth? Cinda's hand flew to the back of her head, but Gary was quicker. He snatched another one from the other side, and when she tried to stop him, reached up and grabbed the last one he could see. Hair began tumbling down around her shoulders. 
Gary smiled at the astonished and, if he were truthful with himself, peaked look she gave him. Once more, he slid an arm around her waist and drew her close. I really do dislike hairpins, you know. Caught off guard once again, Cinda dropped her forehead to his chest and stammered out, What'll the Coens think? Given the opportunity, he managed to find another pin before she caught on. Why should they think anything but that you enjoy your hair down and free, as I do? Shoulders shaking, Cinda buried her head into his chest again as gasps and a new thought slammed into him. Are they sobs? Cinda, I'm sorry, I didn't mean... He broke off when she stepped back and the muffled sounds exploded from her. Laughter. You, you're the... More laughter. Silliest man ever. Shoulders still shaking, she withdrew a few pins he couldn't see and pressed them into his hand before shaking out her hair. Just watching the waves tousled by the movement and the breeze solidified his decision. You stay right here. He angled her a smidge as if an artist choosing the best light and pose. Yes, just like that. I'll be back in a jiffy. But, yeah. Do you trust me, Cinda? Only love could create such an instant transformation from objection to a smile. Still, his heart swelled at her quiet, confident, Yes, of course I do. I'll be right back. Jervis met him at the door, an uncharacteristic smile on his face, too. It's good to see her again, sir. Will you tell the others that we'll be back in... Oh, a couple of hours, at least. He smiled at the man's unquestioning nod. As champagne isn't permitted these days, perhaps they'd have bottles of ginger ale ready. We may, Lord willing, have more than one cause for celebration. I'll let Martha know. She'll bake a cake, I'm sure. That settled. Gary rushed back to Lucinda, helped her into the Studebaker, and jogged around to his side. Once in, he did something he'd thought about, agonized over, and even dreamed of. Gary leaned over, slid an arm around her shoulders, and tugged her closer. Sit with me. The pink returned to Cinda's cheeks, but she didn't refuse. In one graceful move, she slid to his side and, while too self-conscious to look at him, the smile on her face told him he'd pleased her. Ten miles. I have to find some way to fill ten miles. Then what? Sand and beach? The carousel? Miles flew past at a swift 35 miles per hour clip, and Gary need not have worried about filling the time with words. Before they'd made it out of the gates, Cinda slipped a hand around his arm and leaned against his shoulder. Bliss. The outline of the Whirlwind Dipper coaster slowly emerged on the horizon. Almost there. Cinda turned to look at him, and only the fact that they were zipping along at breakneck speed kept him from taking the opportunity to kiss her. Are we going to the pier? The Pleasure Pier at Santa Monica? I thought. She shifted away from him, but Gary could still feel her stare. Or was it a glare? Our new friends have just helped me escape a trial for a crime I didn't commit, and you're taking me to, what, a fun house? Gary! A tenth of a mile passed. Two. With arms folded across her chest, Cinda stared out through the windshield, but she didn't move any further away. As he neared the pier, the perfect response, he hoped anyway, came to him. Cinda, I thought you said you trusted me. Once more, he felt her gaze on him. That same hand slipped around his arm. Her cheek rested against his shoulder again, even as she inched closer once more. You're right. I said that, and I meant it. I guess I just don't understand why you'd do... The way she trailed off hinted she'd realized his intention. Cinda occasionally spoke as if she didn't consider herself to be all that bright, but Gary had often disagreed. She could be naive at times, certainly. However... Cinda had more common sense and intuition than most people he knew. How had she not guessed his plans before they exited the Cohen's estate? 
Mental exhaustion and likely lack of sleep, his mind suggested. And you're contributing to more of each with your impatience. Most likely, anyway. The shore, the whirlwind dipper, or the carousel? Which first? I've never been on a roller coaster before. Should we do that first in case it unsettles my stomach? I'd have time to recuperate a bit before we got back in the car. And a fellow can't propose on a rattly, clattering coaster anyway. He parked, hopped out of the car, and jogged around to open her door. If he stood a little close and gazed at her for a moment, it surely could be forgiven. Couldn't it? I'm so glad you're out of there and safe, Gary added. He started to tell her about the house, but his more temperate side suggested he wait. I could drive her over. Why not? She'd think we were hurrying back at first. A quavering smile preceded a, I knew I'd be safe. You were praying for me. I knew that. That smile nearly did him in. The words did. Hugging in public, not the done thing. But Gary did it anyway. We'll find what happened to your shoe so that can't come back on you, he promised. Now, let's go see just how adventuresome your insides are. How romantic of you, Gary Prinz. Nerves showed themselves about the time they got in line. There weren't many people ahead of them, but squealing women and roaring men zipped past. Cinda fidgeted. It is safe, isn't it? They wouldn't want to risk people getting hurt. I've ridden it several times. Well, if you can, so can I. The bravado lasted until they climbed into the cars and waited for the ride to begin. Gary... You're safe with me. But are you safe with me? A glance at her showed Cinda blushing. What if I get sick all over you? Taking her hand in his, Gary squeezed and whispered, I'll survive. Twisting, turning, the car occasionally threw her into him, and Gary did his best not to crush her. Only the Monday lack of crowd allowed them their own car. That and a knowing look from the operator. One last dip, another twist, and the car rolled into place. Head thrown back, eyes sparkling, Cinda laughed and squealed before hugging him. Thank you, I needed that. It's as if all that rushing wind blew off the doom and gloom of the weekend. Gary led her away from the coaster and asked, Still game for a walk on the beach, or do you want the carousel first? After a quick survey of the pier, Cinda slipped her hand back into his and said, The beach. I feel like I might not enjoy the carousel as much immediately after such an exhilarating ride. Let's go. Tune in tomorrow for the next chapter. Thanks for listening.